I'm Scott Lachlan, this is the Data Chronicles, and here are your data points. Today, we are discussing the cookie wars with a focus in the EU. Cookies have many different flavors and varieties, pixels, beacons, tracksers, many others. They are all really popular and ubiquitous on the internet. But if they're so widespread, why did I call it a war? I think the fact there is a vast disagreement on how cookies can and should be used. There are two sides. Companies operating websites, they love them. They make websites easier to use, more engaging, tailored, dynamic. They also provide great insights into how a company's customer base is interacting with their service and how to continue to improve their products, services, and engagement. That's on the one hand. On the other hand, regulators seemingly hate them. In their minds, trackers represent the hidden part of the internet where users' information is exploited indefinitely without any type of knowledge or consent of the user. As a result, there are really two sides to this debate. Websites want the data and regulators are trying to keep them in check. So it's a very difficult area to follow. It's very difficult to understand the rules and where things are trending. And to help our audience understand the current state of play, I have invited two of my partners, Yoka Borowitz in our Amsterdam office and Gonzalo Gallego in our Madrid office, both of whom are data protection lawyers spending their days deep inside of this debate. They also come from two countries where the DPAs of both the Netherlands and Spain have recently leaned hard into the cookie conversation. So there's no one better than Yoka and Gonzalo to sort through the noise and give us the insight on how companies may use cookies today and how to plan for the future. Gonzalo, Yoka, welcome to the podcast. Hi, thank, thank you. you, Scott. It's a pleasure. Yoka, maybe I can start the conversation with you. Can you just give us a sense of the laws and the legal frameworks in the EU that may apply to cookies? Yeah, absolutely. So in the European Union, there is various laws that actually apply to cookies. We have the general data protection regulation that focuses on the use of personal data that you collect by means of cookies or you use. So it's personal data. But in addition to that, we have the e-privacy directive. An e-privacy directive is a fairly old piece of legislation, but it's still applicable. And because it is a directive, it is implemented in each European member state in a slightly different way. And that this makes it quite complex. So we have a harmonized framework of the GDPR. And in addition to that, we have the e-privacy rules that apply in addition to that, but are also implemented and interpreted in slightly different ways in each European member state. So if we talk about the European cookie, legal landscape, you should always consider both in parallel. That also means that we have regulators that have a slightly different interpretation, but ultimately all use the same legal framework. And then going back to the point you already mentioned, Scott, there is regulators in Europe who are very active in this field. And I think that activity, and that's I think relevant to mention here, is mainly triggered because there were hundreds of complaints submitted by various regulators in Europe in the past few years. There's been a real trend, and I think it started in 21, that privacy activist communities like None of Your Business started to submit complaints about cookie banners and consent methods with various regulators throughout Europe. And as a result of that, those regulators were heavily occupied by reviewing those complaints. Well, that is in itself something which is a, well, I would say, day task already. But because there were so many and so many regulators were busy with that, they decided to jointly team up and create a task force. That task force was created at European level in the European Data Protection Boards. And that is ultimately the, I would say, cooperation between the various supervisory authorities in Europe. So they all sit together in that European Data Protection Board and they issue guidance. And that guidance is generally very strictly interpreted by regulators in a member state level. So generally, companies look at the guidance from the European Data Protection Board and take that as a starting point, in addition to, obviously, the law. And in this way, that would be the GDPR 
and the e-privacy directive. So what happened, there were a lot of complaints submitted by these regulators. Regulators were completely overloaded, decided to team up and created this task force. Task force resulted in a, I would say, guidance note on how to use cookies and cookie banners. And that report is now being well, subject to a new debate. And I think we will need to discuss that today during the podcast because there is a lot happening. But before we dive into the details about the current debate, I think it's important to well briefly mention what was included in the report so people have a bit of an understanding of what the discussion is about in Europe. It is first and foremost about cookie banners. So cookie banners are those pop-up screens that you see if you visit the website where you can generally accept cookies and go to settings or sometimes reject all the cookies. So for those cookies, you can make a distinction between the cookies that are necessary and that are just function. Well, I would say not per se necessary for the services, but helpful for the company that actually deploys those cookies. So that could be tracking cookies, for instance, that could help those companies to target you with specific advertising services and just personalize your experience. So the European view about what you should do with cookies is mainly targeted at those tracking technologies. So making sure that individuals are in control, whether they want to receive targeted advertising, personalized services or not. And in order to do that, you're presented with this pop-up if you go to our website. And the European Data Protection Board ultimately said, we believe that that pop-up should be transparent in a way that people are offered a choice. So they should be able to reject all the cookies or accept all the cookies, but those two options should be presented in parallel. And if you only present accept all cookies and you don't allow people to reject cookies or they need to take certain steps, that goes against the interpretations of the regulators of what would be a compliant way of using the laws. I mean, that's fascinating, Yoka. I'm interested in many things that you said, and Gonzalo, I want you to bring you in this conversation. I mean, I'm reminded of whenever... I'm from the United States, and I'd say whenever I travel to Europe or the UK, I am presented with cookie banners every website that I go to. Whereas here in the United States, you know, maybe one out of five. And it's a very different user experience. And I think, Yoko, one of the things that you mentioned is that we have a common framework within the GDPR, which was largely intended to harmonize data protection without the European Union. But the e-privacy directive then allows for a different set of considerations, which are then localized, which sounds very much like my world, where I have 50 different states all doing the same thing. Gonzalo, from your perspective, how much harmonization is possible with that dynamic, especially Mm. when you have the EDPB who is providing the centralized guidance, which presumably the other DPAs would respect and follow. Yes, um, you are right, because directives in the European Union are not directly applicable to the citizens. Basically, each EU member state has to implement its own laws. And this is what happened with the EU, with the privacy directive. Basically, it was necessary for each EU member state to publish and to approve their own laws. And certainly when it was approved years ago, there were some differences between EU jurisdictions. So you find some places like in Spain, for instance, which was more relaxed and certain cookies were allowed even without a clear consent. So implicit consent was possible. For instance, in other countries, there was a clear requirement for explicit consent. But the, what happens is that once, once we have the GDPR in 2018, which is a regulation that applies directly, so there is no possibility of EU member states to differ from the regulation, there was a kind of harmonization, basically because of the cookies is, are not about personal data only. In the practice, in many cases, they collect personal data, and probably the most important cookies, the advertising cookies, are all about collecting information about users, which... Well, we can discuss if it is personal data or not, but the DPAs in Europe have, I mean, they consider this clear that an IP address or any information collected through a cookie is personal data. So basically all the laws that were basically approved by EU member states after the privacy directive were in the practice harmonized as a consequence of the GDPR. And now of it is true that we have DPAs with um, a slightly different 
suspicion on, for instance, uh, consent uh, or, or cookie walls or cookie paywalls. We can discuss this later if you want, uh, because it's a very interesting topic now. Uh, the truth is that the general rule, which could be that the consent is required and a specific consent is required, is basically, I mean, there is harmonization across Europe. So basically now, the European Data Protection Board, you know, through the task force that has been mentioned by Yuki, is, I mean, has clarified certain specific, very, very specific aspects of the cookie rules, I will say. But the general rule is basically harmonized across across the European Union. And this is why you see all these cookie banners uh, every time you come to Europe. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the areas where, you know, it's easily to get caught up really in the details of this is because the technology here in some ways is just outpaces how the regulators can adapt and frankly, how users could potentially even understand what's happening. And so, Yoka, maybe I'm going to go back to you with a question because you were just making the distinction, which is important, is that while we are talking about cookies or pixels or different trackers, there are actually subsets within those groups that are as important because some cookies are, you know, what we think of as strictly necessary, almost like important for the website to work. If it didn't have it, the website just wouldn't present to users all the way on the other side of the spectrum to marketing, you know, where we're dropping cookies in order for purposes of doing behavioral advertising, targeted advertising, you name it. And I think maybe one challenge to all of this conversation is even getting agreement on what the categories are, what are the rules that apply to different categories, and then for any specific piece of technology, where does it fit within those categories, let alone for us to figure out then what to do about it. Yeah, well, this is a brilliant question, very difficult to answer, if possible to answer. There is no guidance on how to qualify functional cookies versus marketing cookies. So it's very much to the interpretation of the company or the regulator. And I think there is some clear guidance as to which cookies could be qualified as strictly necessary. But what you see in practice is that cookies are quite often used for multiple purposes. There is an element of necessity, but there could also be an element which could create personalization within that same cookie. So making a very clear cut distinction between this is necessary, this is analytical, and this is tracking is sometimes not easy to be made. And what we see with regulators is that regulators take a very strict interpretation and they go for this, well, very narrow vision on everything to be, well, tracking technologies, whereas in practice, certain tracking Mm -hmm. could be necessary to actually deliver the services that the individual is seeking something i think that the problem is even is even bigger because there is no clear view on what a cookie is or what tracking technology should be considered cookies the concept of cookie was established in the european union through the e-privacy directive which was approved years ago i mean they were thinking on the pure cookies basically information what the law says is something like you have to you need the consent in order to basically store information in the computer of a user or to get information from the computer of a user, which is a cookie. A cookie is a TXT file that is installed in the computer. It is there and ah, there was the same website or a different website gets it according to the policy they have. So a pure cookie. However, what happens is that now we have tracking technologies which are not storing anything, strictly speaking, in the computer of anyone. I mean, you have, you have a pixel tag, for instance, there's no storage of information in the computer of the person. Okay, so there was some possibility of saying, okay, then all these new technologies that are tracking technologies should not be captured by the e-privacy directive because are not cookies. I mean, there is no information that is being stored in the computer and there is no information that is being collected from the computer because all the privacy directive and the cookies, cookie rules were not established thinking on privacy. We're thinking on keeping the intimacy and keep and protect the information of people in the computer. So what, they have a different view. Now we are talking about privacy, etc. But the origin was not privacy, and this is why cookies are not only personal data, etc. But the thing is that now what the European Data Protection Board has done, and the, through the, the task force that was mentioned by Joki earlier, has been to interpret the concept of storage in a very, very, very broad way, meaning that. Since there is no specific mention to a time for the storage, could be milliseconds. And therefore, since in the practice, any computer needs to store information during milliseconds and they catch a memory, 
they consider that everything that is able to track the individual or the user can be considered as a cookie in the e-privacy directive. But the truth is that you can find technologies, or and probably we will see in the future more and more technologies that are able to track people. And I mean, it is difficult to include them in the concept, in the old concept of cookies we have in the currently in the EU privacy laws. So it is not only to say to provide a category for the cookies, but it is even it, it, it is even worse because there are some, the difficulties to say when we are in front of a cookie or not from the Euro's perspective. Yeah, I mean, that's a fascinating point and really one to worth pausing on, I think, Gonzalo, because I think one of the things that has become apparent is that you know, there is so much technology around us and often most organizations, most professionals in the space use the technology without actually even understanding how the technology works. And, you know, this has been an area that's caught a lot of shade in the United States because <laughs> there has been a number of enforcement actions against organizations who are using tracking technologies, especially with respect to sensitive data. And as part of those cases, the regulators have pointed out that oftentimes the individuals with inside of an organization who is responsible for deploying the tracking technology may have had no training or expertise in this particular area you know, may have come straight from school and say, oh, well, of course, it's important to enable this type of analytics and this type of pixel because that's what everybody else does without understanding the data that's being collected or how it's being used on the back end. And for, you know, these companies, unfortunately, they got in serious trouble for that. I think what you're describing here is and how this all kind of pulls together is it's very hard to implement a compliance solution without understanding those technologies in order for you to properly categorize them from marketing to strictly necessary so that when individuals are presented both the notices that describe the cookies that are available and that you're properly in describing that. And then second is that you're affecting an opt-out. If I say I'm going to opt out of marketing, but not analytics, well, presumably we have to make sure that the only the analytics cookies are being enabled in that case and not the marketing. And if there is any doubt as to whether an analytics cookie is a marketing cookie or vice versa, we are not actually honoring user choice in that particular scenario. Mm -hmm. So there's only really one way of making this work. And that is means that the technology that is so available has to be known and understood. I mean, what are your thoughts on that? Well, you're, you are right. You are right. And it is also necessary not only to understand the technology, but also to be able to explain all this complexity to the users, because this is a, another point. I mean, it, it is not only that you have to understand the technology, but you have to understand it to a point where you are able to make easy for the users to understand what's going, what, what's going to happen with the cookies, because you have the obligation. And we, we can link this with another obligation under the under the EU laws, which is to be transparent and to provide detailed information to the user about how the cookies are going to work, with the, what information is going to be collected, the cookies that are, that are going to be installed. And this information has to be provided in a clear way. So it means that if even if you understand the technology and you're able to explain everything on a very detailed terms from an IT perspective, I mean, you should be able to phrase this in a way that it is very easy for people who is basically not cheeky. They just don't understand anything about cookies because otherwise this could be a dark pattern. I mean, if you are basically providing tons of details about your cookies, technicalities, et cetera, and, and the user is put in front of a policy of 200 pages of details about the technology behind the, 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 the website, for instance, this probably would not be considered to be a, a transparent. And therefore, you have another problem here. It is that you are breaching the law because you are not providing detailed information and the consent of the user could be considered valid. So yes, I mean, here I think that cookies tend to be underestimated in terms of, of um, how difficult it is to draft a policy because in order to, to balance all the capturing all the technicalities behind this technology, which is more and more complex, because as you have said, it is not only about cookies, but tracking technologies is a huge, I mean, uh, area, but also to be able to explain this on clear terms to the to the users. And um, also not, I mean, not I mean, delivering I mean, tons of information to them in, in a way that they, they, they basically are put in a situation where they are never going to, to read everything because it is, it is huge. 
So it, it's really difficult, yeah. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. Yoka, maybe I want to kind of circle back to one of the points that you were raising, just in terms of where we are we are headed. Um, you know, I heard you say a couple of different things. One is that uh, we have to catalog inventory all of the, the the cookies that are going to be deployed on our various digital platforms. We then need to categorize them within the strictly necessary, functional, et cetera. Uh, we need to have a privacy notice, I'm sorry, a, a cookie notice, I should say, that describes all of the ways these these uh, trackers are being used, the data that's being collected. And then we have to have a proper means by which we are presenting a banner uh, that then gives individuals the option of accepting all or rejecting all, um, and presumably something in between that they can accept some, but not others. Um, and then it sounds like there also needs to be a lot of care and attention that is played to the actual banner itself so that users understand how it's, it actually works. This sounds complicated. I mean, it sounds maybe easy as I described it with just those five different categories, but as I know, and I know you work with companies all the time and actually deploying all of those various things, it can get very difficult interested in, in kind of how you're approaching these set of issues with your, your, your clients and in particular, you know, how you're helping them manage all of these very detailed requirements in a way that's going to allow them to be effectively implemented. Yeah. So it, 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 this is very complicated and there is not a, I would say guidance note that actually talks you through these steps that you need to take. So it, it is very difficult. And it's also very difficult because what we interpreted to be an analytical cookie could be considered having a marketing element to it or having a tracking element to it by the way it is used. So it is working very closely together with the client and their business teams for making sure that you actually have a complete picture of what is going on, but are also a good understanding of what we actually mean if we talk about functional cookies, analytical cookies or tracking cookies. So it all starts with that, making sure that we all have the same understanding of the same technology used in the same way. And I think what is very important is for, for clients to actually have that understanding, but not only to have that understanding, but also make sure that to train the individual business teams about how they can actually use those data that they generate by means of cookies. Because otherwise you can collect something which you believe to be strictly necessary, but that could be, for instance, used in a way that it no longer qualifies as being strictly necessary. So it's difficult. What is also very important is that, well, that, that element of being transparent that Gonzalo already mentioned is not straightforward where it concerns cookies. Because if you apply, let's say, 40 different cookies from maybe, well, various other providers and that cookie is then being shared with third party providers again, how to be transparent in a way that you could still say it's clear and comprehensive, that's fairly impossible. So what we see now with regulators requiring all these cookie tables I'm not sure if the individual user is actually happy or informed or feels that he or she is in control if they see a table with 30 different cookies being listed, with names they can't identify, with parties they don't know, and how to give valid consent to that. I don't think that that is a better situation than we had, well, I would say a few months ago. So it is difficult to achieve this. The steps that you need to take very much depends on a company by company basis. Because it also very much depends on what, what kind of company you are, how you operate in the market. Do you use your own cookies? Do you use third-party cookies? What do you do with the cookie data? What does the other company do with the cookie data? So how to create profiles of individuals also very much depends. So it's a, it's a careful uh, uh, review that you need to do. And that in the, I would say, broader light of the regulatory guidance that applies to you. Because we have companies that, well, obviously target consumers, for instance, in multiple EU jurisdictions. That basically means, going back to the point that Gonzalo already mentioned, various laws, various regulatory sets of regulatory guidance can apply to you with have slightly different interpretations. And you need to help your clients navigate all those challenges. And to give their, give an explicit example, so I think it was the CNIL, so the French Data Protection Authority, that was the first authority to issue guidance in terms of what they expected to be in the cookie banner. That was something which was 
completely different from the interpretation of the Dutch regulator, for instance. So in the Netherlands, we could make arguments for saying that certain cookies would not be subject to consent requirements, whereas the French authority issued guidance saying that that was subject to consent requirements. You can't go to, to your business teams telling them that they need to deploy different cookie strategies in each EU jurisdiction, which may change in a few months from now, because then there is a regulator stepping up with new guidance. So it's it's quite a challenge. But I've never come across a company that we weren't able to help, but it's very much something we need to tailor to the individual company. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. Gonzalo, interested in, in maybe a, a more nuanced uh, kind of issue that's coming up here is that, you know, when you um, you were talking earlier around, you know, getting the right type of consents. Now, you and Yoka and our other colleagues have trained, you know, this American lawyer to always be skeptical of hearing a consent under the GDPR uh, and what exactly it means to have free and informed consent. How is that issue being played out with respect to cookies? And, you know, is there a position that's available to say, you know, most freely available websites need to make some sort of money in order for them to operate. And thus, you know, having tracking technologies is going to allow them to be able to uh, to maintain, uh, you know, that revenue stream. Is there a way to say, you know, listen, if you're not going to accept cookies, then don't come to my website uh, because yeah. you know, there's no way that I can offer it to you just freely without having this advertising mechanism implemented. Yes, well, the, this is the, the main issue we are facing now in the European Union. So consent has to be explicit, informed, and free in order to be valid. It is more in line with the, what the GDPR says with regard to processing of personal data. So information we have already mentioned is what Yogi has been saying about the banners and the information in the policies, etc. But the most difficult thing, I should not be difficult, but it is becoming difficult, is this element of freedom. So freedom means basically that the user has to have a genuine possibility to choose whether or not to give uh, the consent. So any situation, anything that affects this possibility of choosing to give the consent to accept the cookies or not is considered to be uh, to, to making the consent invalid. So there are different situations where when this may happen. But one of the cases which is mentioned in the GDPR is basically that the choose does not exist when the user is put in a situation where it has to consent to accept to to give pers that has to consent the person of personal data here we're talking about personal data uh, in order to be able to access to a service or to a product provided that the personal data is not necessary so i'm talking about personal data because this rule is established in the gdpr but is applied by the dpas by the authorities also in the context of uh, cookies so if you apply this concept of freedom in the in cookies, in the cookie world, what we find is that any system like cookie walls understood as, uh, as take it or leave it, where basically it's a mechanism where, where the user is required to accept cookies or not to use the service, is basically something which is considered to be against the freedom. So basically all the providers are required to give an alternative to the users in order to be able to use a service which has to be equivalent, and we can discuss about the equivalent concept later if you want, because this is the, the issue probably, uh, if in case they just don't want to accept cookies. So you have to have a provider and you give the user two options. You can choose this service by accepting cookies, or you can choose the same or equivalent service under these specific conditions, we can talk about the conditions later, and both services are more or less equivalent or very similar, then you are fine because you are not forcing, you are not compelling the user to accept the cookies um, because they have the possibility to access to the service without accepting the cookies. The problem here is that the service, as I have said, has to be equivalent. In some cases, this could be pretty clear. So for instance, if I'm a video platform, for instance, and I give the user the right or the possibility to access to full content if cookies are accepted or uh, videos without soundtrack or in black and white or with a very poor quality, if cookies are not accepted, then it is not equivalent. And therefore you are still compelling the user to accept the cookies because otherwise the service is going to be very, very poor. 
And another scenario where this, this or another aspect has to be considered, and is the probably the most relevant one now, is, is the price you have mentioned is, okay, what if I give the user the right to access or the possibility to access to the service by accepting cookies, normally behavioral advertising cookies, or I give the possibility to access to a service, the same service could be, but paying a fee, paying a price. Okay, this is something that, well, I mean, the, in principle, this is valid. I mean, the European Data Protection Board and the European Court of Justice have accepted that as a principle, this is possible. So it is, they are not against, completely against the possibility of uh, giving this option. So cookies or payment. The issue is when this payment is proportionate. Because it is, if, the pay, if the price is very high, you are in a situation we have mentioned before. You are still compelling the user to accept the cookies because the price is completely disproportionate. In some scenarios, you can imagine if I, you ask 1 million euros to access to a service, which is very basic one, you can say, okay, this is obviously disproportionate. But there are other situations like subscription fees, et cetera, that are very, very common nowadays in, in internet. Um, and where, where it is not that obvious. And actually it seems reasonable for a provider to, to get a benefit for the service they are providing. This is something that where there is no um, homogeneous position across the European Union, there are DPAs with a more strict view on this, on this aspect, other more flexible. And actually this is something that the European Data Protection Board uh, will be discussing in the next weeks probably in order to try to find um, uh, a position on this on this aspect because it is obvious that that or it is clear that companies must be able to to implement business models where basically where they 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 are paid or they receive any kind of compensation either by advertising or payment or a different way for the services they are providing um, it makes no sense for to ask companies to to force companies to provide services for free I mean probably this is something that that is probably against the freedom of, of business. Um, and therefore, yes, I mean, I, I think that this is a very important uh, important aspect. Uh, we are all waiting to have a position from the European Data Protection Board on this on this issue. But well, uh, answering your question, in principle, it is possible to have uh, an alternative based on payment. However, it is important to be careful on, on the price you are asking uh, for, for the content, because otherwise you have the risk that it is considered to be abusive or disproportionate, and therefore your consent may be considered not to be free and therefore not valid. Do we know of anyone who's ever implemented something like that? I mean, I mean, again, you know, people's expectations are likely to change over time as this stuff becomes more apparent. But I have in this, you know, vision of my mind, and maybe this is not right, but I'm thinking like, okay, I'm going to go to a news website. Uh, in, uh, in in Spain, uh, and I'm presented the cookie banner, uh, and I say reject all. I'm just like, well, if you want to to access this site and reject all, you have to pay me two euro. And all of a sudden, then I have to sit there and type in my you know my my um, uh, my credit card details in order to pay the 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 news site two euro to then be able to navigate this for maybe thirty seconds as I want to look at this one little headline and then go on, you know, surfing the internet in all the different ways. Is this, I mean, is this a business model that we've actually seen before? Yeah, well, I mean, it is. I mean, I think that the first one was or the was probably Meta with, with Facebook and WhatsApp. It was about months ago. It was after a court decision from by the European Court of Justice, which basically confirmed or declared or state that Meta was not able to uh, process data in the context of cookies um, as something which, which, which was, was part of the contract. So the position of Meta was, okay, my contract, I mean, if you want to use my services, part of the payment if you want, or, or, or the way this works is I provide a service for free and you give me, I mean, you allow me to provide you ad, uh, behavioral advertising, which requires cookies. So it was like part of the contract. The Court of Justice said this was not possible, and therefore the only option available more or less was consent. So therefore they implemented a consent mechanism, and they also say, okay, if you want to use Facebook, and I think it was also WhatsApp actually, you have to pay a fee, I think it was five euros, if I remember correctly, uh, which was, I think was the first one or the first one that was so big that people was, uh, was surprised. Oh, oh, so I now I have the option to pay. 
Um, but now, at least in Spain and probably in Europe, it's the same. You find, I mean, hundreds and hundreds of companies with this system. Actually, it is, I will say it is, I mean, could say it is the mechanism by default. I mean, you, you find that most of the companies that have a content which was in the past subject to cookies and behavioral advertising, now they are offering the alternative to pay a subscription fee in order to be able to access to the, to the content. So now it is very, very common in the European Union. And this is why I have said that it is a very important topic and it is something that, I mean, must be clarified by the European Data Protection Board very soon because here we are talking about the business model of, of most companies uh, active in the internet. That's really, really interesting. I mean, at, at some point, I wish somebody would publish the data about how many people actually decide to pay versus just, you know, accept the cookies and move on and see exactly, you know, how much work and effort and inefficiency we're creating just for per- people to create a choice that nobody wants. Uh, but maybe with, with that, Yoga, uh, um, you know, as we, we uh, kind of wrap up here, I'm interested in your perspective about where you see other developments coming from. So, you know, Gonzalo mentioned this important point uh, around uh, guidance on the subscription-based model or this payment-based model for consent. Um, interested in your perspective, if there are other things that are on the horizon, because I know in particular, the Dutch DPA has been leaning into this de- this debate um, and mm-hmm. where you're seeing that the, the outcome of that. Yeah, so the Dutch DPA was actually granted additional funding for cookie law enforcement. So 500,000 euros a year for well, issuing guidance on cookie, but also cookie law enforcement until 2026. So it's a pretty it's a pretty hefty increase for the Netherlands if you see what, what the well what the Dutch uh, DPA got. So what they will do is they will review the market in terms of how companies use cookies and how that complies with, well, back again, the GDPR and the e-privacy laws. I think that is an important development. I also think that that well creates a bit of uh, debate in the market, not only in the Netherlands, but also outside of the Netherlands, because there is so many countries where this is a hot topic at the moment. There is, from the top of my head, guidance from regulators in well, the Netherlands, Austria, uh, Belgium, France, uh, Spain, the UK, so there is, this is not something that this is only a topic in single EU jurisdictions. This covers Europe as a whole. I think the the, the alternatives that, that Gonzalo already mentioned are very well to be considered by companies. And I think in addition to that, if you want to not use cookie data, but still want to do advertising, there could also be an alternative for seeing if you could do advertising based on account data rather than on cookie data. With that, you... To, you step away from that e-privacy discussion, and that's actually going to resolve, I think, quite a few questions. I think what is also important to mention here is that the European Data Protection Board takes a very strict view on that payment for cookies. They initially, I think, want to argue that there is no way that we could validate that pay or OK model. So that model wherein you say OK to cookies or you have some kind of subscription payments. I think it's important to keep in mind that pricing is not part of the GDPR. Pricing is not part of the e-privacy directive. And with that, the European Data Protection Board may have an, an opinion about it, but pricing should not be the driver for certain guidance. And I think what well, Gonzalo already mentioned, pricing in itself is not per se prohibited. It was confirmed by the European Data Protection Board a few years ago that pricing could be an option, a valid option, which they now seem to have forgotten. But it has also been confirmed in other laws, other laws that apply to companies just as important as privacy laws and e-privacy laws. So, for instance, the the omnibus directive that we have in, in Europe, but also the digital content directive, even the draft e-privacy regulation All of those laws confirm that there is an option for using some kind of paid methods for allowing people access to your services or to the content. So we shouldn't only consider the EDPB in this context. I think we should really push for the EDPB to give the European Data Protection Board to give guidance about the legal basis for processing personal data and how to use cookies in that regard. But they should not be involved in the discussion about pricing. 
And they should not issue guidance, at least from my perspective, in a way that, that goes against well, other directives that explicitly allow for using these kind of methods. So long story short, I think a lot is happening in Europe. And I think it is a fascinating opportunity for, for companies to, well, follow this interesting topic because a lot will happen and a lot will happen on a very short notice because we know that the European Data Protection Board is having his meeting about this topic in a really short note on a really short notice so within the next couple of months likely by the summer we have some additional clarification and guidance from the regulator yes, i mean you okay it, it not all, it sounds like a lot is happening in europe that sounds exactly right it also sounds very messy uh and to try to sort through how to to navigate these uncertain waters uh you know sounds like a, a herculean task and at the same time i heard you say a moment ago that enforcement may be increasing uh, as uh, you know additional DPAs are funded with the expectation that they're going to increase enforcement in this area, which I think for many organizations is quite scary if we have uncertain obligations and at the same time, you know, we have the hammer that they're wielding to say we're going to take, you know, enforcement action. Maybe um, Gonzalo asked the last question to you, are you seeing the same thing that Yoka mentioned um, uh, in Spain or anywhere else in Europe where we're expecting additional or increased enforcement around yeah. cookies? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is something, I mean, in Spain, there was announced uh, a kind of ex officio investigation. So it's when the DPA decides to, to check how companies are fulfilling the cookie requirements. Uh, in order, you member states, is more the same. I think that this is also because since the DPAs are not, I mean, have not the same position necessarily on this issue. They are trying to establish their own position by basically investigating uh, and um, issuing resolutions where they are establishing their position. Because if all the people is is fulfilling the criteria of a DPA, then it is easier for the DPA to to basically to try to impose their position in the in the context of the board of the European Data Protection Board. So yes, definitely yes. I think that this is um, something where DPAs are focused now. Uh, I'm seeing this in Spain and in other and in other countries. Fines in this area in Spain have not been very high uh, in the in the I mean in the history, but but now probably they are going to be higher and higher since this matter is starting to be. Uh, a more uh, interesting topic for the DPAs, yes. Well, really appreciate both of your insights and expertise on, on this podcast. I certainly learned a, a lot, and I'm sure our entire audience did as well. Yoka Gonzalo, thanks so much for joining me on the podcast today. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. With that, I'm Scott Lachlan. This is the Data Chronicles, and those are your data points.